Hi there, this is Rajat Navlaka, your host at Evercoach and Business of Coaching. And today, I have someone super, super special joining me on this couch. We're going to have conversations that revolve around how to create epic content and how to really be able to inspire people and be able to connect with them to be able to expand your coaching practice. This person is known for phenomenal content that he produces almost on a daily basis and he's just such an impactful leader in our coaching community. I'm super proud and grateful that today my guest took the time to come out here and hang out with us and talk about how you can also create a thriving coaching business using content and using content. Jason Goldberg, thank you so much for making the time, my man. Thanks for having me here, man. I am so excited and pumped because I've always been so inspired with the amount of content you can put out and the quality of content that you put out and all the strategies that have been playing on the background and building such a thriving and successful coaching business that you have today. Thank you, so man. before we go there, let's start with the question around the biggest fear of content or even the biggest dialogue of content in our coaching community. Yeah. Often people, often coaches are concerned about how do you create clients and in that process they stumble on the idea of you should do content but then something happens and we fail to take action. You know I fail to take action. So tell us what happens. Yeah, it's the same with me. I'm, I'm not immune from this either, right? I didn't just like wake up one day and like content was easy. Uh, I oh, think, I thought that was the case. No, no. Should, I, should I leave? This yeah. Is, <laughs> no, but it's but it's true. And I think I think some of the, the the two biggest things that I see that coaches are afraid of when they start creating content is number one, nobody's gonna see it. Nobody's gonna read it. It's nobody's just it's just not gonna be seen by anybody. So why do it? Or number two, if it is seen by people, it's not gonna resonate. Right, like who cares? Who cares what I think? Why would anybody want to read my stuff? There's so much content out there. So those two things together, I'm not sure what I can actually create that would resonate with people. And even if it would resonate with people, I don't have a big audience. And, and I, you hear about the algorithm and like all this stuff. It's like, well, what's the point? So I think they get scared of what to create and whether it'll actually be seen by anybody. That's interesting. I also find myself into falling into the trap of saying, it, it, it's kind of procrastination that, let, let me be honest and give a term to it, it's procrastination where I'm like, hey, I, I, I want, I know I should be doing this. I have a little bit of following here and there, but I just go, I don't want to feel, I don't feel like doing it. Do you know if that happens and if that happens, how do you go about thinking about that and, and beating that? Yeah, a thousand percent because, because of these fears of it, like not being good enough or like who's going to care, then yeah, procrastination sets in. And, and I think one of the really important things to recognize, because th you know this, it's thrown around so much, like content marketing, do content, do content, do content. And, and we're looking at content, but we're not looking at context, right? I always say all the time, context before content. And so if we look at this and we stop saying like, oh, I should create content because that's what people say I should be doing because I need to have a social media presence, like all these like in order to, right? I do this in order to get that. I do this in order to have people see me as a certain way. If instead we shift the context and say, as coaches, we have one job, it's service, right? Serve love every day, right? Serve, just be out there and serve. If we can look at creating content as another way to serve people, right? If the deepest level of service we can give somebody is in our one-on-one -on -one coaching or in a group coaching or whatever it is, like real intimate coaching with somebody, if that's the deepest level of service we can give, creating content is a way to micro-serve people, right? Mm. Every piece of content I put out, I should have the same feeling, the same perspective, the same goal, the same context, is that I wanna put something out into the world that can serve people. So that way it's not about like self-promotion and it's not about like me building my personal brand. It's about me saying, I wake up every morning and ask myself, who can I serve today? And creating content is the simplest way that I can do that. I love that idea. I love the idea of saying, hey, it's like a micro service. It's a small smudge, a small little thing that you give away and say, hey, maybe this will make your day better or, or something like that. Yeah. How did you get started and how can somebody else also get started in really thinking about especially when they are fighting that, because it's a daily fight, right? When, when you're not feeling like I don't have an audience, especially if you start comparing your audience to somebody else's audience, you're like, oh crap, I have nothing. Yeah. I got nothing on this community. I, I don't have the authority. How do you get yourself started? Because a way to build that audience is to actually produce content, but <laughs> it's like the yin and yang, or you don't have the audience because right. you don't produce any content, and you don't want to produce content because you don't have any audience. Right. So how does, how does somebody navigate that? It's such a great question, and, and, and you're so right. It's like the chicken and the egg, right? Like which comes mm -hmm. first? And here's, here's the way I like to look at content that's really helped me to stay more consistent, is that I think one of the misconceptions about content is that content is for today, right? That content is for now. So, so let me tell you what that means. 
when most people are thinking about creating content, they're saying, okay, I'm gonna create this piece of content and I'm gonna do a Facebook Live today or I'm gonna post an Instagram story or I'm gonna post an Instagram caption or whatever it is. And they go, this one has to be the one. This has to be like the powerful piece. This is the one that's gonna get me a client or get me an enrollment conversation. And we put so much pressure on this one piece of content that's gonna make or break our business. Mm. But content is not only a short game thing, it's a long game thing. The content you create today is not just for today. It's for the person that stumbles upon you three months from now, six months from now, a year from now, two years from now. And I didn't even realize this until it happened to me where there's a woman who reached out to me and said, I saw a Facebook Live you did, I loved it, it really resonated with me. And she reached out to me because she wanted to talk about coaching. She wanted to have an enrollment conversation. But she also went further and she said, listen, when you popped up in my news feed and I saw this, and this was just an organic post, I saw your Facebook Live, and the first thing I thought was, wow, this is really good, but who is this guy? Did he just some flash in the pan that came out of nowhere? So she goes back to my Facebook profile, scrolls through and sees I've been creating content for years. And that gave her confidence that it wasn't just this one piece of content she saw today, but that I have a track record. I've left left little breadcrumbs of transformation over the past years. So know that when you create a piece of content today, it's just as much for the person who has no idea who you are yet that finds you six months from now that will give you credibility and want to have them reach out to, to talk to you or to work with you. Wow, that's fascinating. And it also relates back to, we are, at an, we are recording this at an event here in Croatia and, and many people that will walk up to us, and I know this is the same case for you because we have talked about it, who would walk up to us and they'll be like, we've been following you for years. And I'm like, oh wow, I, I didn't even know. Like, this is the first time we are having a human interaction, not even an online interaction with these people, but they are like almost, they know everything about us just because they've been following us for such a long time. So it may feel like, that nobody follows you, but there are people that are right for you, they are following you. I'm kind of like drawing out the message that you just said. Uh, And and they are following you for the reasons and you will never know when it is time for them to be able to finally put their hand up in in the air and say, yes, I'm interested, yes, I'm curious, yes, this is right for me. Yeah. Right. Well, and, that, and that's the, I love that you said that. That's such a key a key message that I think everybody needs to know because all of us are guilty of this. I, well, let's not say everybody. I'm definitely guilty of this. You post something, and then what do you do? The refresh. You're wait, waiting for the likes. You're waiting for the comments. You're waiting for the shares. And we've been so programmed to look at the vanity metrics that that becomes our metric of transformation. Mm-hmm. It's not a metric of transformation. It may be a metric of reach. It may be a metric of eyeballs. But it doesn't at all tell you anything about transformation. Mm-hmm. Transformation occurs when somebody who never liked your stuff, never commented, never shared it, comes up to you in an event and says, I've been following you for years. And I've had that before with people. I've had somebody actually sign up for a program before. Okay, so I had somebody in like a lower cost program and they, there was a Facebook group. They didn't post one time in the group. They didn't respond to any of my Facebook lives. They never liked it. They never commented, never did anything. Then at the end of that, they had the opportunity to work with me at a deeper level and the two of these people signed up. And they reached out to me and said, I'm signing up because I had the best experience of my life in your program. (laughs) And I I literally said to them, I never saw you once in the program. And they said, well, I'm kind of a background person. I don't like, I don't comment, I don't do any of that. But believe me, I was taking in the content. So let's not focus on vanity metrics and say that that's a measure of transformation. That's so true. And I want to touch on metrics, but I want to also take the point that you just said, because I thought that was so powerful. I was with a coach who was coaching us. And she was coaching us on event models and how to really build events and so forth. And one of the things that she said just in passing is the best students are the ones that don't engage sometimes. Mm. And they are also the ones that are usually the fastest ones to say yes, because they're not, they're not trying to impress anybody. They're trying to see if you are the right person for them. Yep. So they're taking in as they should be taking in. They're like being real students. They're like taking in the content, they're learning. And then I realized I am like that. I'm one of those guys, you would not hear me speak for two days in the event and last when you're making a pitch, I'll be like, how much was this anyways? And then I would go ahead and sign up if I really was interested in that. So then I realized, actually, I I am like that. So there are people like me who are following us as well all the time uh, for us to be able to learn from one day whenever that day is. But I want to get into Matrix because I know this kind of baffled me for, for a long time and I only started to realize that when I started looking at Matrix and started comparing Matrix to Matrix to see what it's like. We look at profiles and there's like, oh, 5,000 people liked it, 3,000 mm-hmm. people liked it, a million people liked it, some profiles mm-hmm. have like millions of people liking it, hundreds of thousands of people liking it. I'm like, wow, dude, this, was, this, this person is crushing it. But then you look at how many followers they have and then you get a realization of how many people are actually engaging and then you tend to realize 
what you are getting as a matrix which looks like crap to you is actually amazing a lot of times so you might be judging you on matrix that you think are not good but they are actually great i want you to speak to that because i know that was a big realization for me it's it's huge it's so so ha first of all it's the relativity of how many people are actually following you versus how many people are engaging but it's also this thing where we're so lucky as coaches, right? And the majority of people who I'm, I'm sure will be watching this is that what we do for the most part is a premium price product, right? We don't need hundreds and thousands of people paying us to have a very successful business. So if I have five people that have liked or commented on one of my posts, those are five people who are saying, I like you, you're like me, we're both the same kind of weirdo, something about what you post resonated, and I'm just letting you know that I'm on board with your mission. That's five people that I can reach out to and see if there's some way that I can serve. I don't need 10,000 people to like my posts. If one person likes or comments on my post, that's one person I can reach out to and have a meaningful engagement with. And that's all we have to do in this business. We don't need to have millions of people liking our stuff if we have a business that's based around intimacy and based around you know, deeper coaching and longer term engagements and, and higher, higher margin, higher price kinds of things. The, the low metrics are fine. It's what we do with that. It's how we engage back with the people that are engaging with us. That's, that's, that's amazing and I want you to expound even more on the idea that you presented in this, which is you don't need a thousand or 10,000 people liking your stuff. You need five, 10, 15, 20, because that's the thing that we forget, isn't it? Like we forget we are not in the mass business. We are not PNG or Coca-Cola trying to sell sugary water to other people. We are trans in the transformation business which also is very personalized. We are not in the mass transformation business as well. Most of us are not. We are in a very personalized undertaking. Uh, so I, I would love for you to speak to that a little bit more. And, and if you could draw out some numbers, yeah. that would be amazing because that, that gives a realistic view to people to go, okay, if I have say a thousand followers, right? What is the approach that I could think about that would put me in a state of saying, I can create more content and I don't feel disheartened about doing this. Absolutely. If you, if you really break it down, um, let's say you wanted to make $5,000 per month in your business, right? And let's say you're charging, let's say you're charging $5,000 for six months of coaching, right? If you know, and this kind of goes and you tell me how deep you want to go with metric stuff, but let's say you know that if you have 10 enrollment conversations with somebody, that one person signs up at that $5,000 level that essentially you need to have 10 conversations with somebody per month. So about two and a half calls a week, right? It's two to three calls per week. So if you need two to three calls per week, that means you only have to be meaningfully engaging with maybe let's say even two times that five people per week meaningfully, right? Mm. So if I can't carve out 30 minutes a day to see who's engaging with whatever I'm sharing or be a part of Facebook groups where the people that I want to serve are at and just trying to add value to their world and then finding ways to have conversations with them. For me, a lot of times that's Facebook messenger. But all I have to do is be meaningfully spending a little bit of time each day reaching out to people, maybe engaging with five people per day. And I can pretty simply, if you look at the numbers, have 5K a month coming into my coaching business. So you don't have to even have uh, content where you're like going crazy. Some people will say like, you should be posting three times a day on Twitter and four times a day on Instagram, mm -hmm. on three times a day on Facebook. I don't do any of that crap, man. Like I, I, I'm minimal. Like I like to do sometimes five times a week right, that I'll do on Facebook, because like basically once a day, and a lot of times it's just a Facebook Live, and I'm just sharing my insights, or I'm sharing whatever's going on in my world, and then those people that engage with me there, I can engage with them, but I don't need a ton of people to do that. It's beautiful. Now that we've talked about the resistance towards content, let's talk about the creativity of content. How do you go about, and how have you, let's start with how have you utilized content in creating transformation in your business and growing your business. You are somebody who, from what I know, you've used content as the uh, bedstone, if that's the right word, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, to, to propel your coaching business dramatically. You've used content to create conversations, to create a very, very thriving coaching business. So if we could speak to that and say, okay, how does content, first of all, translate to, to really a business? And then I would love for us to tap into the creativity of content as the, as the, la, as the next section. Yeah, I love that. I, I just, I, I'm in love with content because I think it does so much. So this is a topic I'm very passionate about. So 
what we know, and anybody who follows Coaching Mastery and follows Evercoach and all this stuff, everybody knows that coaching comes from conversations, right? You have conversations with people, really good, solid conversations, not 10 minute teaser sessions, not something where you're like doing false scarcity and urgency to get people to be freaked out about their lives, they sign up with you, but really serving them, right? So we know that. The missing link is, how do we get people to want the experience of having a coaching conversation with us, right? Mm -hmm. We know once we get them on the phone that we're just gonna do our thing, we're gonna do our magic as coaches, the thing we love to do. The, the, the challenge becomes, number one, how do we get people to want that experience of us? And number two, we start saying, well, that, now I feel like a marketer. I don't wanna be, I'm not a marketer, I'm a coach. I wanna serve people, right? And this goes back to that first point. Content is not about self-promotion. Content is not about advertising. Content is not about pitching. Content is a way for you to show people your beliefs, your philosophies, the transformation you've been through, the transformation your clients have been through, it's to give them some kind of sense, it's to give them enough to go on where they say, wow, what this person stands for, I, I believe in that, or I wanna believe in that, or I wish I could live more in that way. The worldview that this coach has that they're sharing in their content, if I was more like that in my world, I feel like my world would be so much better. So I, I wanna always remember that content is my, my way to serve people before I actually get them on the phone. So for me, I mean, whether it's been building out courses or filling my one-on-one -on -one practice or filling in-person live events, education-based marketing, content-based marketing has been huge because people don't just get a sense of, of what I know, they get a sense of who I am. And there's, there's the, a misconception, I think, at least in my world, there's a misconception around content, and a, and a lot of coaches think this, and I think it's one of the reasons that, that they procrastinate a lot and don't put content out, is they believe they have to be the all-knowing expert that does something that nobody else has ever done before. I have to revolutionize mm -hmm. personal growth. I have to revolutionize life coaching or health coaching or business coaching. I have to say something nobody's ever said before. And, and that's just not, that's not the truth. A lot of the times we think it's that success with content is 90% our teachings and then like maybe 10% of who we are, like a little bit of our personality, but 90% how smart we are. But what if it's backwards? What if the success in content and success in getting people to go from being a stranger to you and seeing your content to actually wanting an experience of you in coaching, what if it's 90% who you are? What if it's 90% your humanity, your personality, your quirks, the things that you love, the things you're obsessed with, the things that you wanna make a dent in the world before you die, the things that you can't stand to see injustices of in the world. What if it's 90% that? And then 10% your wisdom, your teaching, the actual content that you would share with somebody. And, and when I made that shift in my business, because in the beginning, you know what my content was? My content was sharing quotes from Oprah and Ram Das and, and Deepak Chopra. And, I remember, and from me. And, for, and from you, of yeah. course. I mean, you're my, you're my content guru. Uh, and then I remember one day, one of, one of my coaches at the time said, you know what, man? We know what Ellen DeGeneres thinks. What do you think? And that really woke me up because mm -hmm. there was nothing about Ellen DeGeneres' quotes or Oprah's quotes that had to do with their wisdom. It was about their being. It was about what they brought into the world, how you felt as a, as a result of watching their stuff. And so that was the turn for me. It's like, you know what? What if instead, instead of worrying about being this super smart, revolutionary guy who's making up a brand new everything, what if instead I just started sharing my heart and started sharing my experience of life and my, my, my outlook on life and my philosophies and my beliefs? And when I started doing that, I had so much more followers, so much more growth in my business. And it wasn't because of any slick clickbait or tactics. It was because I was actually doing something that resonated with my audience. Mm. That's... That's amazing. And, and so you talked about a little bit towards how to present yourself and 80% of your content is you. Isn't that also one of the most difficult things to do? Because it also needs a lot of um, self-discovery and I would say almost, almost a lot of self-acceptance to be mm -hmm. able to go, oh, this is who I am. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and that's, that's one of the biggest things, and I know you know this distinction because we've talked about it before, is ego versus service. Right, ego versus service is one of those distinctions that's like at the core of my being. And anytime I get in this place of like, I'm too scared to put this out there, or like if I share this story, what are people gonna think? Or what if this talk's not good enough? I'm always an ego, I'm never in service. So when I think about this like, you know, putting content out and being worried about, you know, how people are gonna view me or anything else, I'm, I'm in a place of ego. So, so it absolutely requires a ton of self-discovery. It absolutely requires a ton of, of introspection and reflection. And, and you don't have to like go all in when you're creating content. You don't have to share. There's a difference between personal and private information, 
right? Mm. I'm fine sharing personal information, but I don't share private information. So this is mm. not a thing where you're like, oh, well, Jason said I have to share who I am, so let me tell them about all the horrible stuff that's happening in my family. Like, mm -hmm. okay, wait, that may not serve, right? That may be private mm. and there's other people involved. But if you can start getting a little more clear on saying like, listen, little by little, here's what I believe. You don't have to believe it. I, it's just really important for me to share, to speak my truth, right? To say whatever it is that I really care about. And you're not saying you're right. You're not saying you're the end all be all. I never want to do content and say, this is the right way to live. If you're not doing this, you're living life wrong. I would never do that. I want it to always be a very gentle invitation. Here's how my life used to be, or here's some things that I've been challenged by, or here's some things that my, cha my, my clients have been challenged by. And for me, or for us, here have been some things that have worked for us. Your mileage may vary, I'm just introducing this to you, and hopefully it's helpful. And when we do that, we don't have to worry about being the expert. Nobody can argue with you when you're just sharing your experience of the world. There are ways to put content out in the world that, that you don't have to be fearful that there's gonna be some backlash or that it's somehow gonna come back to haunt you, if that makes sense. That makes perfect sense, that makes perfect sense. You m I know one part of your journey while you're developing content, of course, on social media and all that, you did a big experiment, it started as an experiment, on creating content which is counterintuitive to a lot of coaches, which is you said, I'm gonna take my material and I'm gonna make a course around it. And then you publish that course. Tell us a little bit about that story and, and I would love if you could present how that actually helped you transform your coaching practice. Yeah, this was a big one. So, and I was scared. Like, I, I don't want anybody thinking that either A, I was never scared about content, about sharing content, or B, that I don't still get scared about sharing content sometimes. So what happened was I had this, uh, I had this idea that I wanted to create this course, right? This is a course that eventually became Playful Prosperity, but I wanted to create this course. But I also didn't want to put a whole lot of work into a course that nobody would like or nobody would care about, right? But I also didn't want to do a bunch of like market research for six months. And I didn't want to, like, I didn't, I, you know, there's a lot of stuff I didn't want to do. I was actually being kind of an entitled schmuck, you know? Yeah. yeah you know. Lazy. <laughs> that's, that's another word for it. It's just lazy, Jason. Efficient is Efficient. the word you've taught me. Efficient. Okay. So, that's true because so. I am insanely lazy and I had to reframe my own dialogue. So... I call myself efficient now. You are the most productive, lazy person I know. So, <laughs> so, so, I, so I wanted to, to have some level of certainty that the content I was going to share would resonate with people, but I didn't want to do a bunch of market research and I didn't want to create an entire course that nobody would care about. So I said, listen, I want to be creating more content. There's this cool thing called Facebook Live, which was not brand new, but it was still kind of new, newer. It had just been released uh, to, to, the, to the, new, the, the, the regular people, right? Facebook Live in the beginning was only for celebrities, and they finally started introducing it to the, to the normies like me. <laughs> and and so, so I said, you know what? I'm going to do this experiment where for 30 days, I'm going to go live every weekday for 30 days, and I'm going to share the exact concepts, the exact teachings that I want to put in my course. Now, I didn't tell them I was doing that. I didn't say, hey guys, I'm doing market research to see if you'll like this. I'm just like, for 30 days, I'm gonna give everything away. And I told mm -hmm. some people, they're like, why would you give stuff away that's gonna be in your course? And I said, I don't know. But I just feel like this is what I need to be doing, right? So I'm gonna do mm -hmm. it. So I did 30 days of lives, and every single one of them, they were just me teaching some concept that I thought might make it in the course. And at the end of the 30 days, I went back and I saw which ones had the most views, which ones had the most engagement, which people were asking more questions, saying, hey, tell me more about that, or that really resonates, or oh my gosh, that's so helpful. And I went back and I looked and I said, okay, the ones that were the most helpful, the most popular, I'm gonna take those concepts and I'm gonna teach those in my course. So I did market research by just sharing my message for free. And then I went back and just deleted all those Facebook Lives. Right? So they weren't there anymore. Now you don't have to delete them, you could leave them because of course in the course I went a little bit deeper than I did on the Facebook Live. But that was a way for me to get really comfortable with sharing content, really comfortable with being more consistent, really comfortable with being on camera, and I got solid information that told me, yes, these are the things that resonated and these are the things that didn't. And I was surprised. There were certain Facebook Lives I did, I was like, this is gonna be the one. You watch, this, one, <laughs> this one's gonna blow that up. always happens. Oh my yeah. God, crickets. Yeah. Crickets, nobody yeah. cared. I'm like. Yeah. Really, I'm so surprised, but fine. The market has spoken. So that one gets put aside maybe for something else and I only use the ones that were actually in the program. So in doing that, it made the actual creation of the course so much easier and that course ended up being a huge success when I ran it because I knew up front that people were gonna enjoy and resonate with the content. That's amazing and I know, and I just wanted to relate it back to that because I know you, you mentioned it, is not only that that became really successful, but you were able to, of course, build a lot of strategies to get people into Playful Prosperity, but you also utilize that 
to be able to actually have a fully booked coaching practice. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So it was. So that was the funny thing. So I didn't mean for any of that. I I had no uh, I had no goal to get clients from doing this. I literally was just doing it as an experiment for me to get out of my comfort zone and, and to to serve and to test out these messages. And then I remember in particular, there's one woman in particular who. She was watching the Facebook Live and she shared one of the Facebook Lives in the 30 days and she shared it to her timeline. And all of a sudden, this woman came on that was a friend of hers that happened to see it from her timeline and she watched the video and she started engaging. And this is maybe day seven or eight of the 30 days. Then I started seeing that same woman who I had no connection to whatsoever except for this person who was a mutual friend of ours start showing up every single day for the things that I was doing, for my, my Facebook Lives. That person from that one first Facebook Live that her friend shared that I had done has turned into, I don't know, something like thirty or forty thousand dollars worth of revenue from that one person because she signed up with multiple offerings for me. So had I not just got out there and said, this is not polished, I didn't have a studio, this is me on my phone, on Facebook Live, in like my home office, there wasn't any fancy lighting or audio, there was no production value whatsoever. It wasn't polished, but it was helpful. And that's all people want is helpful. And so it shows mm -hmm. you like not just for course creation, but anything that you want to do out in the world, people need to know that there's some kind of confidence level in what you do. There was a saying back in the 70s uh, that was nobody ever got fired for hiring IBM, right? So mm -hmm. IBM at that point was mainly a consultancy. And so big companies would bring IBM in to optimize their systems. And it was a known fact. If you paid to hire IBM to come in, you would never get fired for bringing them in because they were going to do an awesome job. By creating content, you essentially give people that, right? People mm -hmm. say, well, nobody ever lost money by hiring Jason. Nobody ever had a bad experience by hiring Jason because the content shows them, this is what I can expect when I work with him. Oh, that's beautiful. And that reminds me of stories and so many of them now that, over years now, where you, where you show up and you're showing up at a place where you expect nothing. You think nothing's gonna be, like I remember, as you were saying it, I was like, oh, that recall that, recall that I was getting at the time, was where I went to this mastermind, which was, um, I think maybe like 10 people were in the room or something, or 10 businesses, so like six people in the room, six, like six businesses in the room, so like 10 people in the room. Um, and, and that one event, when we clocked over the course of two years, was worth quarter million dollars to our companies. And I was like, there was like eight, 10 people in that room. There was like nothing if you think about it, right? But it was worth that much over the course of two years because you never know. You don't have to be polished. You don't have to be highly uh, concerned about it. It has to be like thousands of people that I have to speak with. I don't need to have a big following. None of that is required for you to be able to really create a thriving business till the time you can produce creative, well done content that resonates with the right audience. Which brings me neatly to the next part of my conversation that I wanted to have with you today, which is how does one get creative? Mm. So, that's a big question. I it's love a very it. simple so, question, yeah. really. It's the shortest question I've asked. <laughs> it's the today. shortest yeah. question yeah. ever. Uh, you know, this is one of those things where, for me, I I know that content is always uh, content creation for me is a is a creative act, right? I mean, the word creation, right? Creative act. And the reason I say that it sounds like, yeah, dude, I get it. It's content creation. Of course, it's a creative act. But the reason I say that is what I mean is it's not an intellectual act. It's not something that you like sit in a room and force yourself to come up with ideas. You create content by being out in the world, by being in action. And when people would ask me, they, they've asked me before, like, how do you create so much content? And I say, I just, I get out of the house, I do stuff, or I read, or I watch videos, or I have coaching calls, or I have sales calls, or I have whatever it is, but I'm out in the world. Go to the gym, go to the dog park, Go hang out with your friends. Go to dinner with your family. That, that one will give you a lot of content. Uh, <laughs> there's so many things you can do, but it's just, it's not an intellectual exercise. Mm -hmm. So nobody, I, I haven't seen anybody who creates epic content by just sitting in their room by themselves all day, every day and waiting for inspiration to strike, right? And, and you've probably, you've heard this, this, uh, this old quote, this old phrase before. I think it's by uh, M. Somersault Mom. And he says, I only write when inspiration strikes. Luckily, it strikes every morning at 9 a.m. Right? Mm -hmm. He puts himself into the position for inspiration to strike. You read mm -hmm. the things, you watch the videos, you engage with the people. And by doing that, if you're priming yourself for it, then you'll see opportunities for content. And for me, and we talk about this all the time, story is such an important part of content. Right? Because we learn in story. We watch movies because of story. We watch TVs because of story. We, watch, we read books because of story. So if we can find a way to take an everyday story and relate it back to a lesson that we want people to learn, that lesson will stick so much more deeply. 
-hmm. And if a lesson sticks more deeply, who do you think gets credit for that lesson sticking, right? You, if somebody's watching your content or reading your content and something you say resonates, they don't say, oh my God, that's an amazing thing that, that Ajit said, I'm gonna go hire this other coach. No, they go, this is the person who just gave me that insight. If I ever wanna coach with anybody, that's the guy I'm gonna coach with. So going back to how to be creative though, is really just scanning your day, right? Like looking at what's going on in your everyday life. Some of my best content, the stories are not sensational at all. People mm -hmm. think they have to have sensational stories. Like, well, I, you know, I never survived a plane crash. I never delivered a baby in the back of a speeding taxi cab in New York City. Nobody you relates, I, I, well, I mean, I personally have, but just don't get it, no, no, I haven't. But that's the thing, people don't want sensational stories, they want relatable stories, right? So you going to the grocery store and then being out of your favorite almond milk and mm -hmm. you tying that back to scarcity versus abundance will land with somebody much more than just saying, abundance is everywhere, don't be in a scarcity mindset. That doesn't land mm -hmm. for people. But if you relate it to everyday things, they look at you and say, wow, this person is a real person, they do everyday things, and that lesson's really gonna stick with me. So content creation doesn't have to be crazy. You look at what's going on in your world, you ask yourself where there may be a parallel between what it is you teach and what it is you believe in in that story, and then you just share that with people, and it does resonate. That's beautiful, that's beautiful. And I, and I see how beautifully you take everyday, th everyday things and actually make them into great stories and great metaphors and great uh, teaching lessons or learning lessons at the time. You, you talked a lot about priming. You talked about how to, how to utilize daily events to be able to create stories and, and content pieces. I've struggled personally to be able to take an everyday event and make it a story, mm. personally. Uh, and I'm just being selfish right now because I have you in the chat. <laughs> Uh, is how do you, how do you do that? So this goes back to what we were saying before about being really self-aware and like really being introspective and like which, understanding who you yeah, are. And, which of course I'm not. So which you're neither. Not. Introspective, yeah. absolutely no. <laughs> Self-awareness, I don't even know what that means. You're so. completely unevolved. It's, unevolved, uh, yeah. We're going to no get idea. you there, bro. We're going to get at I'm some trying. point. I'm trying. That's why I'm sitting down with you right now. <laughs> I hope I'll be enlightened after this interview and this conversation. So, so but it's, it's really important though because w when you do that, when you get clear on, on what's important to you and what your beliefs are, you start noticing uh, the, uh, the lessons that you wanna teach, right? And this goes back to really knowing your own story and your own transformation. So for example, if you know, if you've done the work on yourself and you, you, you've done the introspection, unlike you, of course. <laughs> if, if I'm anybody like failing, else, yeah, failing. Yeah, yeah, for the 99.9% <laughs> of people who are watching this that are not like you, no, I'm kidding, uh, that have done all the self-awareness stuff, they may see that there are certain things that have really helped them a lot. And actually this, this does go for you, right? So like you and like global grit, right? Grit, resilience, that's like a big thing, right? How to, how to bounce back from adversity. So if you know, for example, that resilience is your key message, then when I'm out in the world every day, whether I'm coaching somebody or I'm being coached or I'm reading something or I'm just living my life and doing everyday stuff, I wanna always keep in the back of my mind, where are the things that I'm seeing every day where that thing that I just experienced could be a backdrop for the lesson of resilience, mm -hmm. right? Because it's not enough, we can't, the content that doesn't work is the finger wagging content that just says, you should be more resilient, right? And we talked mm -hmm. about this, it just doesn't land with people. And, and we know this mostly, if you, especially if you have kids and you tell your kids like, you should eat your vegetables. They don't eat their vegetables, but it's, it'll make you healthy. I don't care. That doesn't help me at all. So you have to make it worthwhile for the person who's reading or listening, right? So, so I want to scan my day and say, where are the things where I could bring in a message of resilience so it actually lands with people? Because story breaks down people's resistance. Story mm -hmm. is what outsmarts the ego so that they'll actually listen to the message. So for example, here in, in Croatia, you know, Ajit, one of the biggest things in my life, one of the most important spiritual things in my life is my hair. Okay. I know, that's the most important thing in my life too. It is. You, you meditate on my hair, right? This is like, no, um, that was, I was talking my own hair, on your but, hair. but go for it. Whatever, however you like to. We so, clearly have a narcissist on the table here, you guys, in the chair right here. Narcissism is great for content creation. Okay. So when we got here, one of the biggest, most stressful things I do when I travel internationally is find a barber. Because if they screw up my hair and then I have to go on stage or I have to do something like this, it would be bad for me. I don't want to wear a hat during one of our interviews. So that's one of the most stressful things for me. So I came here and I find a barber and somebody we both know who hopefully we trust said, hey, this is a good barber. I said, okay, I'll go check them out. You trust him, I don't I, just well, letting okay, you know. So yeah. fine, I thought you trust, that's why I trusted him because you trusted yeah, him. Yeah, this is a shout out to Sid, my business manager. <laughs> I do not trust you and this will make it into the interview. We love you, Sid, and we, we trust you. So, um, <laughs> so, so he says to go, go to this guy. I said, great, so I'll go check him out. 
And the thing is, my, my glasses, I am blind without my glasses. Like, I don't have a third eye. Like, I, I'm blind without my glasses. So I go to get my hair cut. I have no idea if this guy's going to be any good. He speaks almost no English, which is fine, but we can't communicate. I show him a picture on my phone of what I want my hair to look like, and then I pray. So I get in the chair. He puts the thing on me. I take my glasses off. I can't see anything. And there is a distinct possibility that when I put my glasses back on, I look like you. I mean, I don't. It could be anything. I don't know what could happen. They, that would... the, there are so many comments, by the way, Jason <laughs> made. He's talking about the third eye. He's talking about my head collection. He's talking about my hair. He just said that he. I may look like you. What do you mean? No, that's an upgrade. I look a good-looking guy. It's an upgrade. Yeah. You're, you're, you, are the, you are the John Legend of the coaching industry. You're a good-looking guy. Thank you. So, so but, finally, I feel good enough. I, there's a distinct possibility when I put my glasses back on, I am not happy with the result. Right? He could have messed something up. He could have done this or cut too much here or too little here. Who knows? But what I know for a fact through my entire life, since I was born up into now, is that no matter what I do to my hair, it always seems to grow back. No matter how much I butcher it, no matter if I shave it, no matter if I do whatever to it, my hair grows back. So when we're walking through our lives and we're worried about, I don't want to put myself out there. I don't want to ask this guy or this girl out. I don't want to propose this fee to, to a client. I don't want to ask this really hard question to one of my clients because I'm afraid that it's going to be too edgy and uncomfortable for them. Know that your resilience is built in just like your hair growth is built in, right? So where in your life are you treating this powerful question or this edgy thing like it's some big deal when really it's no different than you having your hair cut? No matter what happens as a result, you'll always bounce back. Now that's gonna be a lot more powerful for somebody who reads it or sees me talk about that on a Facebook Live than me saying, hey, don't worry, if you screw it up, you'll bounce back. That mm -hmm. doesn't resonate. But you mm -hmm. put the story with it, a very basic story, and now it resonates. That's true, except if your clients were bald. That's uh, true. <laughs> then it I'm doesn't joking. work at all. Yeah, then the then whole interview goes so away. It doesn't land for me at all. No, I'm, I'm joking. Of You're course, not that's my beautiful. ideal client. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> it's a beautiful story, and I see how wonderfully it relates it all back and communicates it. I, a, a simple yet profound message that otherwise would be hard to communicate because you hear it in many different ways. Like everybody says, oh, be resilient, right? Everybody says you can bounce back, yeah. but it doesn't land. And especially when you're actually struggling, you're like, uh, yeah, thank you for telling me, but screw you kind of, right? Yeah. But in that way, it, it's like, oh yeah, that lands, that, yeah. That, that goes home, that lands home. And I could see how that story, if somebody who's struggling right now, as you tell the story, he, they might go, wow, that's, that's great. I want to know more what Jason talks about. And, mm. and we all put up uh, Jason's Instagram handles and Facebook handle and all that. You could go follow him. His great content was awesome. Uh, you know what else that does, though? Can I just yeah. say one more thing about that? Yeah. When somebody is, is consuming content where that's story-based, as soon as the story starts, and, and you know this, like I, I don't know if you experience this, and I'd love to know. Of course, now most of the movies we go see are pretty action-based movies. But even still, like when we sat down for Avengers Endgame, right? Mm -hmm. Were you tense or were you like relaxed that you get to see a movie on a big screen? I was relaxed. I was excited. Yeah, yeah. you were excited, yeah. but you were relaxed. You weren't yeah. super tense. Yeah. As soon oh. as you're putting out content that has a story, people relax. Mm. And they say, oh, this person's telling a story. I can relax. And mm. when you're relaxed, you take in messages more. Right? There's a reason. I remember when I was in grad school and I was doing my MBA, I had one professor and he was the youngest professor in the entire college. This guy's like, I think he was 41 years old and a tenured professor, which is a big deal to be that young and to be that successful in, 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 the, uh, in the college. And every time we'd walk into class, he'd have a funny clip playing from YouTube. Mm. And everybody just thought like, oh, that's, you know, that's Dr. P. He just plays funny stuff when we come in. So at the end of class one day, I was really curious and I went up and I said, Dr. P, why are you always playing like a funny YouTube video when we come in the room? And he said, well, here's what, here's what happens. When I play a funny clip, you laugh. And when you laugh, you relax. And when you relax, you're more creative. And when you're more creative, you're also more receptive. And so when I go into teaching what I'm teaching, instead of you being like this and resistant and pushing it away, you've relaxed into a place where you can really take in what I'm saying. And he was very good in the Socratic method. A lot of questions, right? So when I ask these powerful questions, these tough questions of the class, you're much more likely to have a creative answer. You're much more likely to participate in class because you're not tensed up. And that's when I really realized that the power of story is not just emotional connection. The power of story is also to relax people into a story so you can actually implant the message you want. It's almost a little inception-based, right? It's, this is what I call stealth help, right? Instead of self-help, mm -hmm. it's stealth help. You give somebody a story, you entertain them, you relax them, and then when you slip in the message, they're just so much more likely to have that message land. I, I think what's landing for me really strongly, because I tend to not lead with story. I sometimes go, 
boom, let's go. And there's a speed train running towards you on the five steps to do something. <laughs> Um, and, and I've realized that that doesn't land often with people because I'm guessing what happens is they're like, oh, I just live. Oh, crap, I have to find my journal, which, of course, is not useful on a Facebook Live while you're trying to get entertained because half the people are like, hey, crap, I don't want to find my journal, and they just move on, right? But I see, and I've seen a lot of people say power of story, power of story, power of story, and I hear that all the time, but I think what's important that you mention here is it's not only power of story, it's about getting the person that is listening to be receptive to what you're even going to talk but about. But here's something too though. Yeah. This is actually, I love that you said that because you do have a lot of, I, I mean obviously I watch all your content, you have a lot of stories as well. And this is actually a beautiful thing about telling stories also. When you are consistently telling stories, you actually can also share content where there's no story. Right? Mm -hmm. Because you've built up that goodwill. People know that typically when they see you, there's a certain feeling that people have, right? And everybody that is a, a thought leader or whatever out in the world, there's there's some feeling. This is what I talk about in, in this, this distinction of looking at what you're known for versus what you're known for activating in other people, right? Focusing less on being the expert all the time, what you're known for, and instead focusing on how do you make people feel. Right? So if I'm somebody that I bring, I activate joy in people, then every time I go live or I share content, I need to be in the energy of joy, and that's what people come to me for, and then whatever they learn is a bonus. If you happen to be somebody that's more like stoic or more like uh, grounded and more peaceful, people want to feel that too. And so they say, when I want to feel grounded and peaceful, I go watch your content. And they start getting a sense of how they feel by being around you. Story helps them to get that. And as you're doing that, it also means once in a while, if you want to just pop in and say, here are five tips that I think will really help you, people are down with that because they already have implanted in their head, oh, this is Ajit and he makes me feel this. And I remember this other story he told this other time and you've already built enough goodwill and connection where sometimes you can go right into teaching if you want to. Oh, thank you. Yeah, that, that's, that's actually very true. I do tell stories sometimes, but I'm also generally a very likable person. You are. I think that's, that's the real reason why people watch everything that it's I the hair. have. To say. It's the it's, hair. It's the, it's the fine quality of hair that I have. And the recipes. Uh, and, my, and, the, and the recipes <laughs> that, that I present. Uh, but for anybody that's watching, if you think this has been useful, go ahead and type in, that's awesome. So we know that you're loving what we're talking about today. Now, let's go to the last section of this conversation. We've talked about creating content, value of content, how to, how to get, get past your own stuff, how to really think about content and so forth. Let's talk about real translation to business, mm. right? We, we talked about courses and we know that generates revenue, but let's talk about real translation to business and growth of business because we talked and touched upon it by saying, hey, listen, you do content, even if you have a little bit of following, you can translate to revenue. But how does that really show up in business? How does that really show up in your day to day? And how does that translate to, to revenue for uh, revenue or even better results for clients if there is any? Yeah, it's, I love that you said, I love that especially you added that last part because content is, is, is so multifaceted because content is for client creation, but it's also something that you can use for client retention, right? So if I, Chris, so I'm gonna do the second part first and then I'll go to the first part second. Anytime, it's actually a part of client creation as well. Anytime I create a piece of content, whether it's a Facebook Live or it's a written post or whatever it is, I want to be thinking which of my current clients can really benefit from this, mm -hmm. right? And I want to personally send it to them. When we talk about like client astonishment, not just customer service, but astonishing our clients, it means the reason that, one of the reasons, at least for me and I hope for a lot of people, that we don't take on that many one-on-one -on -one clients at a time is because we want to be able to serve them deeply but even deeper than that is, I wanna have those clients on my mind at all times. So anytime I see something, or I'm reading a book, or I've attended a seminar, or I've created a piece of content that I know would resonate with them, I can take a second and personally send it to them. So you actually can deepen your transformation with current clients by sending them the content that you're creating for the masses. And a lot of people will say, well, what does that matter? It's, if it's my content I'm creating on Facebook, couldn't one of my clients see it? Yeah, of course they could. But the fact that you took the time out to say, I specifically had you in mind when I created this. Or right after I read this, I thought about our last coaching session and I really think this is gonna anchor in the thing that you committed to doing for our next session. That is, that's another level of depth of, of service for our clients. So, so your content serves that purpose, which is beautiful. Also great for client creation. If you have prospects out there that you've been talking to and maybe you're in negotiations or you're in between sessions, send them the things you're working on personally. Don't, don't send them a link or something you know, via email, like Facebook message them and say, hey, I was thinking about you, I just created this thing and I think it'd be really helpful based on the conversation we had last week. So 
all of those uses of content in a very active way. Uh, I always like to say that with content creation, as it relates to business building, there's an active way and there's a passive way, okay? The passive way is great when it happens. You put out content and somebody Facebook messages you and says, oh my gosh, that was amazing, how do I work with you? And that will definitely happen. It doesn't happen overnight, but as you're consistently creating value, it will absolutely happen. I have tons of my clients, myself, you I know, you put out content, people reach out to you. That's the passive way and it's amazing. But there's also the active way. And the active way is a little bit about what we talked about in the beginning, is when somebody engages with your content, likes it, you know, comments, does whatever, you reach out to them and say, hey, thank you so much for taking the time to comment on my post. I know how busy you probably are, and the fact that you took the time to do that was really, really amazing, thank you. What was it that resonated the most with you about that content? Or you know, what was it about that that really hit you? And now you're in conversation with people, right? And what do we wanna to do to create coaching clients? We wanna be in conversation with people. So the content directly works for that as well. But there is literally no part of my business that makes me money that content has not had a huge influence on. So parts of my business, my book, selling my book, having a live event that, that I put on, having an online course or, or a group coaching program, my one-on-one -on -one coaching clients, even speaking, like speaking on other people's stages or being hired to come in for corporations, there is not one facet of my business that content has not improved. And so one of the things that I hear a lot from people, and this may be some of the people that are watching this now, is they say, well, I don't understand the purpose of creating content. I don't want an online business. I get it. You don't have to have an online business. And you talk about this at, at length. I mean, especially look at your business. You have in a room of 10 people, but when they're the targeted 10 people, they're perfect for you. You didn't have to do anything with Facebook ads to get them in. You just serve them in person. And so people say, well, then I, I don't need content. I want to go out and do that thing. But here's the thing. You're gonna meet the person in person. You're gonna meet them at a networking event. They're gonna see you at a Toastmasters. They're gonna to see you speak at an event, whatever it is. And they're gonna go look you up. Mm -hmm. And they're gonna go see what you're about. And they wanna know if this interaction that they had with you was a fluke or if you're the real deal. So creating content online is a way for people that have an emotional connection with you in person to create a rational connection as to why they'd wanna work with you. So there's so many things. I've had people with speaking engagements. They reach out to me and they say, hey, we wanna bring you in to, to speak at our, our event or for our company. And I say, great, like, let's have a call. So we get on the phone and, and we're talking and, and I'm, I'm extracting from them what they'd want. And then at some point in the conversation, I say, okay, cool. You know, would you like to hear a little bit about what I typically speak about? And they go, oh, we've already watched all your videos online. We love your energy. We love your message. This is more of a formality. And it's like, wow. I can shorten my sales cycle by creating content. I can make it easier for people to reach out to me by creating content. I can create more certainty and belief in the people that are thinking about working with me by creating content. So there is a direct tie to revenue in any parts of, if you wanna be a speaker or an online educator or a coach, there is no business in this realm where content is not hugely beneficial. Absolutely, and I would say there is no business in any realm. Yeah where content is not hugely beneficial. You can look at any company that you love. The company you love, you love because of the content they produce, even if they're ads. Yep. That's why you love them. Yep. Uh, it, it, that is a part of the product positioning, right? Uh, but of course, especially in the training, education, information related businesses, coaching related businesses, content plays even a, a greater role because that's really what your product is as well. Yeah. So absolutely 100%. And I, I love some of the ways that you presented information today because it can be really like anybody that's watching right now, if you are finding and you're struggling with really putting out that content, just watch this episode again because there's so many beautiful nuggets that will tackle the challenges that you might face as a person uh, to get past yourself. Uh, you will find strategies around how to think about content, how to think about stories, how to really put it out in different formats. You mentioned different formats that you have used to put out content. And you can look at anybody that you follow, you love, you you think they're amazing and you would you aspire to a, a, a success or a success story like them and look at them, right? Every single one of them have had a solid foundation of content before they became outrageously successful and however right they want to be successful. So, so I think that that was beautiful how you landed that and I, and I loved it how you ended it as well is by saying, hey, listen, everything is on the foundation of content. There is, there's no other way of really doing business in our reality. Use internet, use other channels. That's not, the, that's not the challenge, the question. The question is, are you creating content? And are you creating it consistently for people to be able to even know you are the right person to talk to? And the faster you get, get past your own stuff, the faster you will get past whatever you need to do to be able to create content. Now on that note, is there something that I should have asked you on content that I completely forgot? 
which is very likely, but. <laughs> something about hair products probably. No, uh, <laughs> I, I don't know that it's something you forgot to ask, but I, I wanna, I, I just am uh, keying into uh, people still feeling like, I still don't know what content to create. And I, mm -hmm. and I would love to give just one more little hack that may be helpful to get started on content creation that's very, very simple. Um, so I would almost guarantee that the majority of people that are watching this, probably everybody that watches this, has some kind of uh, uh, education uh, regimen they're, they're doing. They're reading stuff, they're watching videos. Obviously, they're watching this video now, right? One of the easiest ways that you can start getting into creating content is let's say you read, I don't know if you read in the mornings, I typically tend to read at least a little bit in the morning, some, some kind of a passage of a book or something. Read something, read anything that you just love reading. And when you get to something that resonates for you, ask yourself, if I were gonna be talking about this in my language, if I were gonna be saying exactly what they just said through my own lens, through my own beliefs, using my personality, not trying to copy what they said, not stealing their idea, but if I was gonna look at what this person just said in this book and teach it in my way, how might I say it? Because people are always saying, well, I don't know what to talk about. I don't have any ideas of what to talk about. But if you're taking in information, then you have tons of ideas of what to talk about because you have information that's in front of you. Don't reinvent the wheel. If it feels like, oh, I don't know how to connect the dots between my message and things that are happening out in the world right now, fine. Baby steps. First step, read something in the morning and after you're done reading for 15 minutes, ask yourself, what was in what I just read that I could teach in my own way and how would I say it in my words? And to me, that can be a really, really easy way to start moving in that direction. That's amazing, that's a great hack. And I'm guessing everybody that's watching this will probably be creating videos right now about how to create content yourself. Uh, so <laughs> thank you so much, Jason, for My taking pleasure. the time, sitting with us for almost an hour and really giving that whole masterclass, which as well could be a course itself right now in how to create content. Uh, thank you so much. We'll hook up all the links to follow Jason and learn more about Jason on the description of this video if you're listening to it in the audio description. Thank you very much for watching. Leave us a comment. Tell us what you loved about this particular interview in this particular conversation. And also tell us what you would like to know more of because that tells us who to bring next on the show and what is the next conversation we should have. Go ahead, smash that subscribe button. Like it if you loved what you just saw and heard and share it with somebody that you think may find this particular interview useful. Thank you so much for watching. Serve and love always.